My name is Joe Christian Bergum. I work at Yahoo, and I've been working on Vespa, the big data open uh, search engine, for 17 years. Unless you have been living under a rock for the last three years, uh, you probably heard about semantic search. Um, and there is a new promise that semantic search will uh, improve the search experience compared to traditional keyword search. So what do I mean by traditional keyword search? Um, for traditional keyword search, you typically have sparse, sparse documentation, document representations and sparse query representations and you have a very high dimensional sparse vector space, and you can retrieve efficiently uh, in this sparse vector space using the inverted index. So Apache Lucene is an example. A lot of great search engines are built on top of keyword search. Then on the other hand is the new paradigm which involves mapping text and queries and documents into this dense embedding space using some type of model, and then retrieve documents using approximate nearest neighbor search or brute force nearest neighbor search. <clears throat> I'm writing a little blogs on, on Medium, so every day or every week I get um, new blog posts from Medium curated for my space of the internet. Um, there's probably thousands of these, um, and semantic search with expert, set expert is all you need, um, and lots of how-tos, how to build semantic search using vector search. Um, so these are interesting. And based on this, the tooling for vector search is really becoming more uh, mature, so even old workhorse for search, Apache Solar and Apo uh, Elasticsearch, now has support for approximate nearest neighbor search, which, in, which is used for semantic search. And through Apache Lucene, that is exposed in Apache Solar, Elasticsearch, uh, we have Vespa, VV8, Pinecoin, Quadrat, so there's a lot of technologies coming out, and we also see that vector search is now being added to traditional databases like Redis, Postgres, ClickHouse. So vector search is all over the place. In this talk, I'll deep dive into uh, supervised machine learning for search ranking, and I will introduce you to the MS Marco relevancy dataset. So I'm wondering, are there any here with PhD in information retrieval? There's a couple, so that's great. Uh, luckily, not the majority. <laughs> um, I'll talk about language models like BERT and transformer models and how they play out for search ranking. And then finally, look at how these uh, models uh, generalize to new domains. That being said, in Norway we have uh, a saying that um, a loved child has many names. So semantic search also goes under neural search, contextualized search, something that is going to improve your search, right? So there's, there's a lot of different terms around it, so I'll, I'll cover a little bit of that. I'll ask the question, is it a hype or not? So we'll try to answer that. First, to do machine learning, you typically have some kind of supervised method. And by a supervised method, you have some kind of labeling so that you label uh, your data. And then you have the machine here, in this case, Wally, looking at something, and he's trying to learn something from this. So the machine is learning. It's not, not actually, but it's abstract. So to do that, you give the machine a set of labeled examples. Right? So in this case, there's an image. It has a cat. Right? So the label is cat dog, and a query and a document passage which is labeled. 
This passage is relevant for this question. Right. So what's new? I mean, we've been doing machine learning for search ranking. I've been involved in machine learning for search ranking since I joined Yahoo in 2007. So learning to rank is not new, right? Uh, it's always been using either explicit labeled, uh, having a human editor annotate the results, or using implicit by clicks, right? So, and the traditional learning to rank has been associated with tree-based models, GBDT, uh, a lot of statistical features, uh, heuristics, and lots of feature engineering. So, learning to rank is, is not new, but the techniques we use is, is new. But first, are we making progress? So MS Marco is the largest relevancy data set uh, that is out there. It's released by Microsoft in 2018. It has about 9 million passages, and it has a total of around 500,000 of these labels. So query, document, is relevant. Um, and these are queries and passages that are sampled from Bing, which is the Microsoft web search engine, and there's a split between train data, development data, and test. And using this data set, we can reason about a ranking method. Does it work or does it not work? We can train models based on the train split to train our machine to do ranking, and then we can evaluate on the test set, and we can benchmark it. Microsoft has these labels for the test set, so you can submit the ranking run, and then they evaluate. And then you have a leaderboard. And the official metric is mean reciprocal rank. Sounds scary, but it's really easy. So if you retrieve the relevant document at position one, you get a reciprocal rank score of one, 0 0.5, 0 0.3. So it's a precision-oriented metric, how well you're going to place that relevant document and put it into the ranking list. And when you have a large set of queries, so the test set is about 3,600 queries, uh, you can basically compare different ranking strategies. Here, on this data set, so using Apache Lucene 8, uh, which is using unsupervised BM25, so BM25 is a text matching um, uh, ranking feature, which simply looks at how many times the term occurs in the document, how what's well, the IDF, and so on. So, it's, but it's completely unsupervised. It hasn't used the training data in MS Marco. Right? But using a method that is trained using machine learning on the, with the training data and then applying it to the test data, that method is much better. Right? It's not a big surprise, but uh, and this gives uh, researchers uh, an ability to kind of test different methods for uh, how to train models, which are the models that work best, and which are the models that doesn't really work well. Um, and there has been significant advances in machine learning uh, with the introduction of deep learning, so using deep neural networks for various different tasks. Uh, and that also includes search ranking. But it also includes driving your car, driving your vacuum cleaner, a lot of different real-world tasks. And the breakthrough was, especially around image data and computer vision, was that they realized that label data is sparse. It's very difficult to get good quality label data, just like the MS Marco data sets, right? So they figured out that as we have a pile of data here, so the whole web, we can come up with some kind of self-supervised learning. So let the machine learn by itself. Right? So you need to come up with an idea there. Then you come up with the model, uh, which has been tuned on this task, and then you apply some task-specific label data. And then you fine-tune it, and they find that by doing this, you, you don't need that many label data, right? So it's a way of scaling machine learning, and we see this in computer vision, and we also see it in, in text. So the basic idea is that you're doing some pre-training, like here, standing on a snowboard, and then it has some transfer 
capabilities to a different task. Right? And BERT, which is a model for representing language, was released by Google in 2018. And it made it to mainstream news because they said that, hey, we have improved on so many different tasks uh, related to text, and we are using it for search ranking, for example, right? And everybody was like, oh, Google is using this new technique for ranking. I was like, it's called BERT. I was like, oh, look, do we have some examples? It's anecdotal. And um, I wrote an article back in 2020, how to use BERT for ranking is the query here, and my article on how not to use BERT for document ranking is top number one. Anecdotal, I know, sorry. But the introduction of large language models for search ranking dramatically improved uh, the results on this data set. So literally, within a week, um, the state of the art increased by 30%. Right? So it's almost unheard of uh, that you can do that kind of advancement in one week uh, in something that people from all over the world, all the universities, every organization had been for one and a half year competing on this MS Marco ranking. Right? So just within one week, putting BERT into action for this model, it actually turned out it worked really well. So, but there's a lot of misconceptions about BERT. I'm not going to go what BERT is, but the pre-training, how you actually initialize and do the pre-training is that you take this pile of text, which is there, it's written, so, and then you can figure out, okay, what's the way to fine tune this model? And they figure out, okay, they do some mass language model, meaning that they will randomize, take out the token out of the text, and then have the model predict what should the word be. Right? So it's a very smart way of kind of pre-training the model to understand itself. And demystified, I like to treat it as a kind of closed box thing that needs a vocabulary because it's operating on a fixed vocabulary and it's a deep neural network architecture. I don't care that much about how things are interacted in this neural network. And it's, it's differentiable so you can uh, train it. And it has a different number of parameters. And but the thing is that in order to shine on a specific task, and ranking is no different, you need to have this kind of fine tuning. So you have the pre trained model. The pre trained model is just trained on mass language modeling, it's not been trained for search ranking, right? So you need to give him some examples. And when you give him some examples, you end up with a model which is tuned, it's fine tuned. Right? And for search ranking, Dominantly, you have labeled data through query and relevant document, like in MS Marco example. And there are two primary methods for doing or for using uh, language models for ranking. One is the vector search representation model, where you encode the query through the language model and the document through the language model, and then you learn representations so that relevant documents are close to the queries in the vector space, and irrelevant documents are far away in the vector space. So you use label data, and the great thing about this is that once you're done with your model, you can encode all the documents through this language model, you obtain a vector representation, put them into VV8, Vespa, phase, whatever, vector search library, then you just need to encode the query, and then you can efficiently retrieve over this dense vector structure. The other model for using BERT or language models is a cross encoder. And, but the cross encoder does not have any way to kind of index the document representation. You need both the query and the document and input it to the model at the same time. Right? So there's no efficient way of indexing that. You need to put Here's the query, here's the document, how's the score? So generally, these methods work better, um, the cross-encoder method works better, it's more effective than the bi-encoder method, but the bi-encoder is typically what we read about uh, in medium posts, because it's cool, you represent it as a vector, and you vector search, and I mean, it's really a relaxed matching, it's, 
It's really cool. Uh, well, the cross encoder, very expensive. Oh, you have to in input two things. You might need GPU. And, but in general, it's more accurate than this way of doing it. So, the conclusion on vector search and in domain usage is that it works great when you are in the same domain. So, MS Marco, for example, you have training data, label data for that domain, and you apply, you train a model on the training data, and you apply that vector search or bioencoder or cross encoder on the same type of data, then it works really well. Right? So, it's in domain, you train it. Right? It's not a big surprise that machine learning works, but in domain, it, it works. Um, and then the question is, can neural search or semantic search replace keyword search out of domain? So, to put things in context, on BM25, the sparse methods, when you're doing a search with that, right, you have those words. The user has typed some words, right? There might be a vocabulary mismatch, but the documents that contain those terms are retrieved, right? So, it's not, it's relying on exact matches, but, and also, it's not learned in any way. It, so, BM25 has two parameters. You cannot use learning algorithm. It's not differentiable. You cannot really train, you can tune some parameters, but this only has two parameters, and it's largely unsupervised. So, when we talk about zero shot, we're talking about domain transfer capabilities. So, and the baseline is usually then BM25. So, if you start up with a new corpus, you're building a new site search or something, and you start up with Apache Lucene, or you can use Vespa, or any of these Apache Solar, and you can use BM25. That will give you a reasonable good baseline, right? Because you're setting up your site, uh, it doesn't have any training data, it's very difficult to come up with a new model that is going to be, so it's a, it's a baseline. And what if we then take these ranking models, the AI-powered ranking models, that's been trained on this huge pile of ranking data from MS Marco, we take those models and we apply them to our domain. How, how does that work, right? So that's what's here is that out of domain, okay, so let's see, you know, how these models, do they generalize to a different data set? Is the ranking better than BM25? So, to illustrate this, we can say we are learning to drive a car with deep learning, right? So, we are learning using this in, in domain learning data, okay, we, we're running tests here, right, it probably works well. Then we try out of domain, and we're like, oh, it's like, ooh, trying to align the plane. It's like, it looks similar, but it's, it's not really similar. So this is kind of out of domain usage of the model. So are we making process progress on out of domain? Well, uh, for dense models where you use vector search alone, big problem is that these models that have been trained on MS Marco, uh, they don't generalize uh, too well compared to completely unsupervised BM25, right? Uh, but these cross-encoder models, they often outperform BM25. They are more computationally expensive. Uh, but I think for dense, for example, I think BM25 on, uh, I think it's like 14 out of 18 datasets uh, that is evaluated in BEER. Um, BM25 actually beats most of these dense methods. But there's some hope. Um, Nils Reimers of, of SentenceBert has an interesting paper on doing as an in-domain adoption so that you can, uh, when you're using a dense model in, in an out-of-domain setting, that you can adopt uh, that model, but then you need to um, take your corpus and then you need to generate, using a generative model, um, questions. So you have a generative language model which, given a, a text passage, can suggest queries that are relevant for that passage. Uh, and you can use that to further uh, tune the model for the out-of-domain usage. And in their paper, they say that and the result shows that that improves the dense model alone. And 
this benchmark, we now see researchers uh, across the industry and, and academia, they're shifting towards MS Marco focus in domain usage to how does these models work out of domain, right? Because it's potentially the next frontier of search that you can use vector search instead of inverted index. And for large-scale use cases, this has many, many be uh, benefits in terms of system performance, uh, scalability, and so on. So there is no big, um, it's no big uh, surprise that uh, organizations that run search at scale and have a lot of training data that they are going from the sparse inverted index into dense retrieval. So the question on can this neural search or semantic search replace keyword search out of domain? Uh, maybe. It depends on the data set. But we're going back to that. You're using data that's been trained out in domain, learning to drive the car, and then you try to use that model to fly the plane, right? It, it's, it's understandable that it, it might have some problems, right? That you need some adoption, right? And that means that kind of the objective that was used on the training has been a little bit different from when you're applying the model. So, Another takeaway is these medium blog posts that will, and they go like this. Here's semantic search. It's going to improve your search experience. And this is how we do it. Then they pull a pre-trained language model from Hugging Face, which has been fucking trained on mask language model, right? It hasn't been trained for retrieval. It hasn't been trained for text ranking. And then they run the query and the documents through that model. And they get a representation. It's a vector representation. It's cool, right? And then they search, and then you have an anecdotal query example. These methods do not work, right? They are at the bottom of the MS Marco. It's next to random ranking, right? So if there's one takeaway from this talk, that's the one. Don't use a model that is trained on driving a car for flying a plane. It's different, right? So if it's BERT, it doesn't necessarily that it's real work for search. You need to in-domain adaption, right? So don't use... <laughs> uh, another key takeaway, semantic search. In domain, yes, it's fantastic. It's fast, it's cost efficient. Uh, you will lower your 99% latency significantly because the weekend algorithm is you have many, many query terms, inverted index. You can, with vector search, you can search one billion documents on one node, single threaded, like in less than 10 milliseconds, right? One billion vectors, one node. I, I will challenge you. Try to do that with inverted indexes, Apache Lucene, Vespa. It, it won't work at all, right? So it's no surprise that people, that Bing, Google, these large players, that they're using vector search for candidate retrieval is no surprise. It has so many great scaling properties. And in domain, with training data, it, it really works great. Similar. Um, Spotify, who is using um, vector search for the podcast search, they wrote about how they're using vector search for in-domain usage, right? Training on their data, adopting that model, and then having uh, better results. But out of domain, it's like this, right? So when people say, oh, we need semantic search. Oh, do we have the labeled data? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe it works. And final, a little bit of Vespa pitch. Um, I talked a lot about technologies now and so on. And typically, when I talked about uh, customers that want to explore these new frontiers of search, um, their architecture diagram becomes a little bit like this. Uh, there's document storage, there's some vector search library, there's some inverted index, there's some GBDT inference for re-ranking, 
Uh, there's a language modeling BERT service, maybe in the cloud, very expensive. Uh, embedding data search, like all these kinds of things, mixing and failure modes and pager duty and whatnot. Uh, Vespa replaces this in one single uh, platform package where you can both do keyword search, uh, vector search, uh, you can do re-ranking, and you can also use DBT, the classic models for learning to rank, and combine all of this in, in one query, in one package. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, now you have the chance to ask some questions, yeah, uh, and uh, the thing is, please lift something, maybe your hand, and then I come by and uh, bring the microphone, because we are online, the people don't understand if you're asking in the room, yeah? So, you were the first, and you were the second, okay? And I come over there. Thank you. Um, so you, you gave example of different domains like uh, driving on the road or uh, landing a, a plane. But um, for regarding uh, text search, how do you, what, con what do you consider as examples of uh, different domains? You mentioned Spotify, but more generally, I think it's difficult to define the domain. What is a domain? Yeah, so this is a great question. So actually, when we started working on, uh, we started the, our work on, on dense retrieval and vector search in, in Vespa in 2019. And in 2020, Facebook came out with a, a, with a paper called Dense Passage Retrieval for Question Answering. This was the first paper that we kind of used to introduce and test vector search with Vespa. And they got really great results on the data set that is called Natural Questions, which is a Google data set. It has a question and an answer in a paragraph, web, right? And their model was outperforming BM25 with a large margin. And we thought, okay, hey, we have this dense model. And what if we use that model for MS Marco? It's similar. It's questions. It's in English. It's similar length, similar passages. It should work, right? It didn't work at all. So it's worse than BM25. Right? So you, you waste a lot of embedding space and so on, but it doesn't work. So that's how small out of domain can be. So it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding maybe flipping the problem. Mm -hmm. We said a lot where vector search doesn't work, but is it fair to say that BM25 does not work when there's no semantic overlap between query and candidate? Um, and that's maybe crossing up between what's a search and what's a recommendation model, but just interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, so definitely BM25, so I hope that the takeaway is not that BM25 is a superior model for doing ranking, right? But it's a baseline. If you don't have any labeled data, uh, using BM25 is usually a very good starting point. Right? If you're starting with, you don't have interaction data, you don't have any trained models, it's simple, there's great tooling support for it, so it's a great baseline. Right? I'm not saying that it's, uh, it's much better, but I think that in Lester's talk later today at 1720 in the, in the big hall, he will talk about hybrid search, that you combine semantic vector search with these keyword matches. And that's the one of the unique capabilities of Vespa is that you can combine these techniques in the same query, right? So one example I used to give is that uh, it's really hard today to give Google a phrase query to say that, hey, I want exact this phrase, right? And it will go like semantic, this and that, you know, really hard to find that phrase. And uh, Vespa will allow you to, even if you're doing embedding retrieval, that you can have that phrase search capability, right? So that's what I'm seeing in more like in the industry is that we need to, we don't need to throw away everything we learn about search, about phrase, about proximity. We don't need to throw that away, but semantic search, vector search gives you the possibility to deal with uh, the vocabulary mismatch problem, right? So, yeah, I hope that was. Hey, Joe, uh, Dmitry Gant here. I really hey. enjoyed the talk, fantastic. Thank and you. I also really enjoyed recording Vector podcast episode with you. Yeah. Um, so if I'm a startup, I don't have clicks, so I cannot use learning to rank, right? Um, so I'm tempted to try dense retrieval. Yeah. 
but I don't want to venture into a uh, vector database. I'm right. a fan of vector databases, but what if not? Uh, there are methods like doc to query, right? Yep. So what's your opinion on that? Uh, or any recommendation otherwise uh, for startups? Right, so if I was uh, a startup right now and uh, I didn't have any interaction data uh, and my domain was text data and independent of technology, uh, what would probably work best out of domain without looking too much into it would be a simple BM25 based retrieval with a cross encoder for re-ranking. Uh, so, so that's one part. The other part you mentioned, uh, a document to query model. So that's a model that I didn't cover here. Uh, that's also a neural network that is trained uh, to predict uh, a question for a passage. So they, they train a generative model. So given this, uh, if you recall the passage about the US president and so on, it will generate a, a suggested query for that passage, who is the president of the United States of America. Right? And that model can then use to augment the index to address the vocabulary mismatch problem. So that's also one of the models that have demonstrated uh, rather strong out-of-domain performance. Oh, I have plenty of questions, so I, I, I prepared. If, so, if you were if you were shy. So, towards the beginning of your talk, yeah. you compared base BM25 with well-tuned BM25, which presumably includes a variety of techniques with uh, 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 n-grams and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, maybe synonym dictionaries, yeah. whatever, whatever. So, the comparisons that are being made in the later part of the talk, it wasn't clear to me whether you were comparing against base BM25 or uh, industrial strength, BM25 plus all the other tricks we've learned over the past 40 right. years. Right. Uh, or, and of course, one legitimate goal might be if, it's, if they're equal in performance, then clearly building synonym dictionaries and building in tricks and tuning and all that, if you can avoid that by using the vector technique, so much the better. Uh, so, how does it yeah. stand? So it's, it's a great question. So, uh, if you look at the, the first MS Marco, the passage ranking data set, um, there you only have a text snippet, right, and a query. So you don't have this kind of title semantic matching, right? And the researchers had been working on this data set for more than one and a half year, right, and it still advances by thirty percent, right? Um, in the setting where you have contextualized title, body, URL, anchor text, and so on. The difference isn't that large, right? In the beer benchmark, you are dealing with different types of data sets. So some data sets have a title, an abstract, or document, so they kind of confirm everything into one blob, right? So as you're right, you're saying when you compare BM25, there are no field level boosting and so on, right? But the differences are still, still there. So in domain, you will not be able to kind of bridge that gap by manual feature engineering. The, the deep neural networks are basically too good. So that's my opinion on that. Yeah. In domain. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you. A very great call. Uh, you mentioned uh, hybrid search multiple mm. times, and I've heard a couple of people uh, talk to me about uh, hybrid search today as well. And I'm wondering, you had that in the, the slide, I think you had it separate from re-ranking. I think you used the, the cross encoder as an example for re-ranking. Um, so I'm wondering, like, what is your definition of hybrid search? Would it be two independent searches, and then we do something with a score? Or would it be one first, then the other? So, so do you have a definition of it? I, I don't have a definition of it, but it's... it's um, if we take Westbus as an example, is that you can basically uh, combine the retrieval, uh, if you know the weak end operator, which is exact matching, which is an efficient way of uh, retrieving over inverted index, and you combine that with a logical OR and the nearest neighbor search query operator. And then you have a target number of hits that you want for each, and you bring up maybe 10 from the weak end, and 10 from the nearest neighbor search. And then there are different ways to combine these different documents into one ranking, right? Either using a linear combination, a reciprocal rank. Uh, Lester will go into that at 1720. So that's what I mean by hybrid search, that you're combining the classic inverted with vector search. 
But then you need to have some kind of ranking, and that could be potentially a re-ranking model like a cross encoder, right? Yeah. One more was here. Uh, uh, then we will go uh, to the online. There are some questions. Yeah. Okay. So yes. Um, I think it'd be very interesting to actually talk about the GPT-3 question you have here. Uh, I know the answer, but I think a lot of people should hear it too. Yeah, so OpenAI, they released um, uh, an embedding model for uh, search. And they were, if you look at the beer benchmark, even this large model was barely on pair with BM25. And this is a model that you will cost you thousands of dollars to encode documents, and at runtime you need to call out to OpenAI query embedding, and then you need to have a vector search library that handles 10,000 dimensions, and out of domain you're still just like BM25. So Apache Lucene will do that for you in one box for free. Uh, so, it's, so be a little bit wary uh, about uh, new technology, how to use it, and the key takeaway, don't use the pre-trained language model directly, right? So remember that, please. Yeah, so. So uh, we go now to the, um, to the last two questions of this. Uh, yeah, yeah no, uh, quick, quick the, the top is number f uh, with uh, four votes, yes? So if you can yeah, so the this. question is how much data would we need for fine-tuning a BERT model for a not-so-popular language, Dutch? So I don't know the question, answer to that because that's in the pre-training part. I think there are Dutch uh, pre-trained language models which are trained for mass language models. Uh, at least there are multi-model languages. And the good thing about pre-training is that Google, they, Facebook, Hug and Face, they've taken care of this for us. They've trained the model so we can use them. But don't use them directly for search ranking. You need to tune them, right? So I don't know the question. No, the answer to the first question. Um, and what does it make a data set good for dense retrieval? Um, you basically need to evaluate, right? You need, you need to test. If, if, it, if you take that model, apply it to your domain, please check that the results are in line with your expectations. Don't expect them to suddenly be on pair with what we see on MS Marco. It's a different domain. Um, when training a BERT model for dense retrieval, can I leave out the next sentence prediction task in pre-training? Yes, you can actually just use, but then you're, you're, you need more labeled examples. It will take longer time to train, but you could skip the pre-training and just have random initialized weights. So, so it's, it's possible. Um, if I understood correctly, MS Marco is mostly for asymmetric search. Does this also translate to symmetric search? I think the question here is that, um, in terms of semantic similarity, is that uh, the document is longer than the query. I think that's what he meant by asymmetric search. Um, so MS Marco is definitely uh, asymmetric. Um, and in terms of symmetric search, I think it's more about the semantic similarity. What we do know is that if you just train models for semantic similarity, looking at this sentence is similar to this sentence, they're roughly equal length, those models does not work that well for search either. Because during search, you're seeing a lot of very hard negatives. You're seeing a lot of examples of documents that are not relevant. And it's very difficult to differentiate. And that's been the key for training dense retrieval models has been how do you pick the negative examples? How do you pick those examples that are not relevant? So, uh, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah, sadly, we have to uh, finish it here. Because, yeah. uh, but thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. So, thank you for all the questions.